Okay. Well, all right, everybody. Hello. Uh, welcome to the third webinar in our June summer webinar series. And I'm Garen Fons, the project manager here at the Center for Open Educational Resources and Language Learning at the University of Texas at Austin. And I'm Natalie Steinfeld Children, Publications Manager of CORAL. Thanks. Thank you for joining us today for the final session in our June webinar series. So today we're going to be uh, focusing on a fantastic project created here at the University of Texas, Texas called Spintex. It's a video archive that provides access to video clips and transcripts from the Spanish and Texas Corpus, which is a collection of video interviews with bilingual, bilingual Spanish speakers in Texas. Uh, we're fortunate to have with us here in the office nearly the entire crew of the project team, including project directors Dr. Barbara Bullock and Dr. Jacqueline Torbio, or Torribio, <laughs> sorry, and uh, project developers Rachel Gilg and Arthur Wendorf. So we're eager to talk with uh, everyone here and uh, hear more about Spintex and learn how teachers can utilize this in their teaching. So before we do that, we're going to take care of a few logistics. We encourage you to make the session interactive. On the left, we invite you to ask questions in the questions column. We will demonstrate the questions. We will moderate, sorry, <laughs> the questions that come in and have our guests respond. Oh, if lots of noise. If you're using Twitter to tweet today, use the hashtag um, CORAL. And if you happen to lose your connection or need to log out for some reason, please log back in under the same name as before. All right, so uh, just keep letting us know if that audio quality is bad for you, but uh, we'll, uh, we'll try and fix it if we can. Um, uh, what we're going to start by saying uh, as well is that many of you who joined us uh, have already indicated your desire to uh, get CPE or CME credits for participating in the session. Uh, for those of you who haven't yet submitted that request for CPE credit, please follow that link in the info section that appears in the left-hand part of the screen and fill out that information. Uh, just note that it's a Google form, so uh, if your school blocks access to Google, you'll probably have to fill it out later. Um, you can also send a note to info at coral.utexas.edu and we'll find you and make sure you get that certificate for attending. Um, note that we will again be recording the session and we'll have it available on our website and on YouTube after the session. With that, we will get started with a few opening remarks. All right. So uh, as many of you know who have joined uh, in for one of our previous webinars, You'll know that this series of CORAL June webinars is focused on the topic of open educational resources in relationship largely to language learning and language teaching. Uh, in the first webinar, uh, we discussed finding authentic language OER by exploring some of the repositories and initiatives where these resources exist. We discussed some sites and repositories specific to lear language learning content like LORO, the Merlot World Languages site, various resources produced here uh, at CORAL. Uh, resources that are in the Orange Grove or Language Box, Jorum. Um, and we discussed also finding open resources in general using some of common websites and services, whether it be using a search provided by Creative Commons or the advanced search on Google for web content, searching for openly licensed educational videos on YouTube, openly licensed images on Flickr, music on Jamendo, or using uh, Project Gutenberg for public domain books, or just finding resources using the Wikimedia Commons. So basically saying that there's a lot of resources out there. We also talked about how the uh, that open resources, uh, basically that uh, people like you are creating resources and these resources are getting so much better. There's high quality adaptable resources that take less time to find and are taking on new formats. We've got lots of new textbooks. We have MOOCs starting to adopt uh, open education resources in their teaching. There's tons of modules and exercises. There's full lesson plans. Uh, and basically, it's to say that OER is going through more calculated phases of revision and staying up to date, and that much, much of what is being created is being vetted and peer-reviewed. There's a focus on authentic materials. There's much easier access uh, both on computers but also in, in mobile formats uh, and also new document formats. And the ability to sort of pull apart these resources and repurpose them is getting easier and more consistent. Um, and a lot of these uh, repositories that we talked about earlier actually invite your contributions and corrections and also additions. So we also discussed uh, at length what it means to be open by talking about the use of Creative Commons licenses, what it means to move from an all rights reserved model of copyright to a some rights reserved model. 
uh, we've stressed the importance uh, in these webinars uh, in differentiating between free and open, noting that while there are many great free resources that on, on the internet and just available in general, that open means something much deeper than just no cost, right? It's something that is tied to the values of a free culture, which is to say that when you have the freedom to change something and when you're encouraged to remix, reuse, revise, and redistribute resources, that you're a part of creating opportunities for yourself and others for deeper learning. So uh, in the second webinar, we spent a bit of time discussing the practices of adapting, teaching, and creating OER. Our guests, Orlando Kelm, Amanda Delola, and Carl Blythe shared their experiences and thoughts around adapting and incorporating open practices into their teaching. We spent a bit of time discussing the value of sharing, not only resources that they created, but also uh, talking about how they're just open, uh, champions of open practices. Um, we made the case that even if all we are able to do is really just share links and get a conversation around uh, OER going with colleagues, uh, it, you know, spreading that word and advancing uh, what we're doing is, is moving the, the cause of open and free culture along. So throughout the uh, entire series, however, uh, we've been really looking at this notion of a changing landscape in education. Uh, we've been talking about the power of open educational resources to enhance teaching and learning, and furthermore, that open educational resources and open practices root themselves in the notion that learning happens best in more organic educational environments, where the idea isn't to force people to learn or simply get students from point A to point B uh, and expect that they'll be okay in a rapidly changing job market or a social landscape. Rather, it was, it's basically, our, we see it as our responsibility as educators and teachers and administrators, support staff, or even parents to sort of cultivate this and provide, I guess, as many opportunities as possible for our students and teachers to develop their own solution. And that's our responsibility to help them create personalized and contextualized curriculum and demonstrate that there are multiple ways of mastering a skill or arriving at an outcome. And since OER are resources that actively encourage you to adapt them, to download them, to take them apart, refashion them, and do what you want with them, it's our argument and the argument of many others that support OER that it naturally encourages more effective teaching and deeper learning. And so what we're going to talk about today also demonstrates that. But before we get on to talking with the project team, I want to mention that if you've missed previous webinars and have an interest in the subjects that I just sort of uh, recapped, we invite you to head over to our website uh, or to our blog and find links to our other two pre-recorded or recorded webinars. So with this, uh, I want to get right into hearing from the Spintex team about what users can find uh, inside this great resource. And uh, we, again, invite all of you to ask questions in the question uh, box to the left, and we'll get going and talking with the presenters about what they have to share with us today. All right, well, thank you, Garen. Um, on behalf of the whole Spintex team, we're excited to be here and to share our project with you. Um, we are talking about the Spintex video archive today, which is both free and open. Uh, it's a website for educators and for learners of Spanish. And this is uh, who the, the t part of our team that's actually in the room with me right now. Um, I do want to mention there are other team members that, um, I'm Rachel Gilg, by the way, I'm the project manager and, and also web developer on the project. Um, the two project co-directors are here along with uh, uh, Arthur Wendorf, who also developed the project with us. And also in the chat room, uh, I know at least I see that Marti Kishal, who has also been instrumental in the project, is in the chat room. Um, so I would encourage any project members who are lurking, uh, <laughs> please introduce yourself and let everyone know what your role is on the project. Um, this is a, we have a quite a large team to put this together, so um, please chime in. Okay, so I wanted to go, start by talking a little bit about the background of the project. Um, this is a video archive, but I want to start by how did these videos come about. And for that, I want to kind of turn this over to the project directors. Um, um, okay, this is Jacqueline Toribio, and I thought I might say a little bit about the origin of the project. We envisioned this project primarily as a means of showcasing local varieties of Spanish. 
So we wanted to document how Spanish is spoken throughout Texas um, and also to provide tools that would allow students and teachers to really explore and value language variation. So um, probably the major goal of our project really is to encourage users to consider language variation um, and the speakers of local varieties of Spanish as important resources for learning about language and about culture. That is to bring some positive attention to local varieties of Spanish and to the speakers of those varieties. Do you want to say something about how it came about? Yeah, so um, in order to do this, um, we involved uh, our local um, Spanish speakers, in fact. So most of the interviews were done by our undergraduate interns who are from um, Hispanic families, and we trained them on video techniques, actually, that were trained by our um, uh, by our, edu our, what do you call it, um, technological services here at our college. Uh, and they went and they went back to the, their own communities and recorded their friends and family. Um, and in this way, we got what we think are very authentic videos because after talking for 30 to 45 minutes, you get pretty comfortable um, talking to your interviewer. Um, so we, we had the students pick who they wanted to be interviewed. So we weren't controlling um, the content that's um, involved in this corpus. Um, we all, as a, as a big group, decided what the nature of the interviews should be like. And that's why we eventually settled on um, this selection of, of questions from the uh, Historias, which is the Spanish version of NPR's StoryCorps. Mm -hmm. And it seemed to work pretty well. I mean, there were a few technological glitches along the way, um, cords that weren't plugged in, what else? Um, we had talent forms that weren't signed and things like that. But overall, they did a really great job. And we ended up with 134 usable videos, um, all at about 5,500 words each, um, giving us a corpus right now that's over 700,000 words of Spanish English. So just to give you a taste of what these videos are like, we have a, a sample that we can play. Um, we'll just play about 30 seconds of, of this video. It's from an interview with a speaker who is from El Paso. And she's going to be speaking about um, the importance of speaking Spanish, what it means to her. ¿Cuál es la importancia del español para ti? El español que como nosotros vivimos, o sea, entre, ¿cómo se dice? Una frontera, ¿verdad? Este, ayuda mucho porque casi, o sea, la gente de aquí habla mucho el español y la comunicación es algo que se necesita, ya sea muy bien, o sea, para los trabajos, para lo que sea, y saber el español, o sea, me ha ayudado mucho porque me comunico mejor con la gente, o sea, uno se conecta más con la gente también. ¿verdad? Este, y pues es bueno saber los dos idiomas. ¿Cuál es la... Okay, so I apologize for those of you who are not Spanish speakers. We, we don't have that captioned. Um, um, but I don't know, does somebody want to sort of jump in and, and kind of describe what that video is about and why it's interesting? We thought this video segment was interesting for a couple of different reasons. Um, one of them is, of course, she talks about the importance of Spanish, and we uh, think it's important to show that it's not just Spanish speaker, speaker <coughs> excuse me, Spanish teachers who think that being bilingual is important. Mm -hmm. And then also, if uh, you're looking at language variation, she does use um, some uh, discourse markers, which are interesting, such as OSEA and ESTE. And so that was another reason why we thought this would be an interesting video. And she's also got the beautiful, um, if you're familiar with Spanish variation, she's got a really beautiful El Paso accent that mm -hmm. comes in very clearly. So she says things like, Mucho, mucho rather than mucho, um, and so these are all sort of features of the video that that teachers could use in their classrooms to draw attention to the way people speak Spanish. Um, and I think more than that, what this highlights is that her Spanish is exceptionally well-formed Spanish, mm -hmm. right? so that we can look to these local varieties of Spanish as models for the classroom. Mm -hmm. right. So we have all of this great, rich, authentic video content. Now, how do we turn that into an OER? Um, so that's the project that uh, we're going to be focusing on now, the Spintex Corpus to Classroom project, which we started last September. And the project was to develop an archive, a searchable 
online archive using the Spanish and Texas videos that would be really geared towards educators. Um, the, the main goal was to create an interface that would be uh, teacher-centered, basically. So currently, uh, you can go to spintext.org and you can find their 327 video clips from 33 different speakers. That number is increasing. Um, we have more clips that are in process. Uh, we did edit the clips. We, we selected, uh, because we know for pedagogical purposes, it's better to have shorter clips. So the clips uh, range between one and four minutes. They are fully transcribed with synchronized closed captions that can be turned on or turned off. Um, in addition, we've you know, given all the clips titles. We've added um, topics to them, which you'll see in our search interface. Uh, and we've done some pretty uh, advanced things in terms of uh, automatically processing them and tagging them for different linguistic and pedagogical features, which will become clear when we look at the interface. So I want to show you another video. This is just a quick introduction. Uh, since we won't be able to do a live demo of the site, I will be showing screenshots. But I think this video gives a, a good kind of short, it's just one minute introduction to what the site is all about. The Spintex Video Archive offers a new way for Spanish language teachers to find and use authentic videos. Quickly search through a collection of fully transcribed and captioned video clips organized by theme, grammar points, and vocabulary. Teachers can also highlight grammar and vocabulary from video transcripts, save and share video playlists, and access other resources like lesson plans. All videos and materials are licensed using Creative Commons licenses which means teachers can legally reuse and remix the content to create customized learning materials. Created by CORAL, the Center for Open Educational Resources and Language Learning, and funded by the Department of Education and the University of Texas at Austin, the Spintex Video Archive is a high-quality, free, and open resource for teachers and learners. Start browsing the site to learn how you can begin using Spintex in your classroom today. Okay, so hopefully that gives you just a, a quick introduction. Um, okay, so when we started this project, the first thing we did was a needs assessment with educators. So we did this through focus groups and interviewing different educators and asked them questions such as, how do you use authentic video in your teaching? How do you find the videos that you use and what problems? Um, we know that a lot of language teachers rely on uh, looking for video content through YouTube, um, which I think all of us can kind of list some of the problems that people have with YouTube. And then we ask them specific questions. How can you imagine using the, the, our videos with your classes? And so this was, this was the basis for how we designed the interface. So one of the primary goals that came out of our focus groups was that we really wanted to enable educators to, to be able to search with the criteria that they uh, had in their mind. Um, so you know when you're searching for a video uh, on YouTube to teach a grammar point, you have to kind of guess at like what kind of keywords might I use to find a good example of this. There's no way to just directly search for what you want to find. So our one of the main goals of our interface was to change that. And so you can see, hopefully this is clear, it looks a little, OK. Um, you can see that we've offered, uh, in addition, this is just the, uh, from the home page of the site, there's a, a full text search. So you can search uh, the text of the transcripts, or we offer what we call a guided search. So you can choose from different topics different grammar points, different pragmatics. In the future, uh, we plan to offer some tags such as uh, functions, communicative functions. Um, so these are categories that we think are relevant to language teachers 
The grammar points actually uh, were pulled. Marti, our, our colleague who is in the chat room, actually went through uh, a number of different textbooks and compiled a list of what were the most popular grammar points. And I will say that this is not complete. This is still a work in progress. So we plan to add to this list. What we have now is, is just the start. So once you've entered your search criteria or clicked on one of the categories, you get to the results screen. And once you're on the results screen, then you can start drilling down and filtering um, to so you can search by a particular topic and a particular grammar point combined and find only those videos that exhibit those two uh, categories. Another goal, um, obviously, the, this, we wanted this to be an OER, so we wanted to uh, build in the site uh, ways for educators to share this content and easily access it. Um, so you'll see when you go into a video page, we have links to share, embed, and download the videos. So, and this is completely open. You don't have to have an account on the site in order to download a video or um, download also the, the transcript. So I want to, I want to interrupt here quickly and just say that for folks who might have questions, please feel free to ask them. Uh, we're going to record them and then either answer them as, uh, as they come in or, or figure out after the presentation if it makes more sense to answer them. But please send your questions in. Another goal of the website was to provide tools that would make it easier to develop lessons around the videos. And some of the features that we have um, it, when you're looking at a transcript, because of this automatic tagging process that we did, you can actually highlight uh, different, uh, different tags on the different words that have been tagged on the text. So you'll see that here it's uh, highlighting all the forms of verb and the, ser, sorry, ser and star that appear in this transcript. You can also remove those words if you want to create a close activity. So this, this has been a very popular feature when we presented this, this site. Um, teachers are, are really uh, responding to this feature. Another thing that we heard from talking to teachers is that often they wanted to uh, put together sets of videos. So maybe they wanted to show or play videos with two different speakers from different locations or maybe compare registers of speakers. And so we wanted to give them a way to put to get to kind of curate these sets. And so once now this does require an account on the site. If you do uh, get an account, you can uh, favorite videos. So you can flag a video that would, will be added to your favorites list. And then you can also add custom tags to a video. And, and the tag can be anything, whatever is meaningful to you. And then once you've tagged them, you can then access your lists of videos that you have tagged with a certain category. And this page then can actually be shared if you wanted to share this with your students. So they could just have a, a, a one page that shows the videos that you've selected for them to watch. And finally, uh, what we heard from teachers is that they uh, also wanted supporting materials. Um, it's you know it's one one thing to provide a video, but if you can provide a, more of a package where you have a lesson plan, maybe some templates for activities, you know that's much more valuable. And so that's where we're really uh, turning to some of the tenants of open education and and working to involve a community of teachers in developing these uh, materials that can be shared. So, and right now I'm going to turn it over. Um, Arthur is going to talk about some of the work that we've done uh, with teachers and some of the ideas we have. You know, this is all in development right now, but we're going to tell you about some of the uh, of our ideas for uh, developing these. All right, thank you. So, um, we have two different types of materials that are available right now. The first type is uh, materials that have been created by other users. So we've been doing a lot of workshops with teachers and they've been using our materials and creating activities for them. Here's an example where you can see 
a pre-activity, and then afterward um, they have uh, content questions and then also discussion questions at the end. So a pretty standard activity format. Um, so we are trying to uh, compile a library of these types of acti activities that instructors are using that we can then share with other instructors so that they can improve on them, use them, and just make everybody's life easier. We also have um, different templates that we're developing. So the first type of template, uh, these templates, excuse me, are based on the four different types of activities that are most commonly mentioned in research on how to use corpora in the classroom. Um, people have been talking about this for a long time, but it's been hard to implement, so we're trying to make that easier. The first type is the closed test, which uh, Rachel has already talked about a little bit, which you can see is very well integrated and is basically just fill in the blank. The second type of template that I'll be demonstrating here shortly is the variation template, which basically we're looking at comparing what a textbook says about how something is used as compared to how it is really used in our corpus. Um, a schema template is to help learners uh, understand that speakers of, or from different cultures look at the same topic differently. So, for example, when you talk about family uh, and you're speaking to an uh, English monolingual North American, you're going to get different responses than you would from a Spanish speaker from Mexico or whatever. So that's the idea with that one. And then finally, the data-driven learning, which is you tell them what you want them to search for, and then they search for it, and then they try to figure out why it is the way it is. Um, so for example, uh, we've had instructors already use this website for uh, using data-driven learning uh, with the subjunctive, and they've uh, had very positive responses from their students. So now what I'm going to do is go through um, one of our templates. Now for each template, each of those four templates, we have the template, and then we also have a concrete example of it being uh, used. That way you can get a better idea of uh, how we intend it to be used. But remember, we, want, we hope everybody will improve on these. These are not the end-all, be-all. So all, each of these templates has three different documents that goes with them. Uh, the first one is instructions for the instructor. So you can step-by-step -step see what you need to do for the template. Um, then is the actual activity, which is basically a worksheet. Um, each of the activities is a Google form. And then, of course, Google Forms produce a spreadsheet. So then we do something with the results. Um, so for this first one, we're looking at variation. And we're looking specifically at the uh, use of the um, adjective este. And so here's the instructions that the instructor would receive. So you, you know, you you need to prepare the students by teaching them about este, have them go to Spintex, have them go to the worksheet, and then they fill out the worksheet using the uh, website, and then you compare the results. So the, we're just going to go through this step by step really easily. Um, a lot of this Rachel has already talked about, but we're just going to recap. So the first thing, because this is a vocab item, is we're going to do a keyword search. So we're going to search for este. This is what well, the search results will look like or could possibly look like. And so you then they click on that video and go to the transcript. Then they can highlight in the vocabulary the occurrences of este. And so now they actually see este being used. And they can listen to it. If they scroll up, they can see the video and see it used as, uh, by the actual speaker. Then they pull up the worksheet. And this is the top of the worksheet, what it looks like. And basically what this template has them do is look for 10 occurrences of the target and then indicate the video ID and the example of use. And then they describe whether it's a standard use as described in the textbook or whether it's some other kind of use. And if it's another kind of use, how is it used? And so here you can see that the video ID is on the uh, URL uh, for each video. And then you can see the use of este. So when they take that, they put that in the worksheet. So this is video 372. And it's este used as a hesitation. So that's not a standard use of este. This is a hesitation use. So. Then we'll go to the results. And this, for this template, this pie graph is automatically generated from the responses. So when you pull up the results page, it'll already have this pie chart for you. And it'll show you how many of the uses were standard uses and how many of the uses were non-standard. And then you can discuss with your class, OK, what kind of non-standard uses did we find? Um, you know, what does that tell you about how the language has evolved? Or whatever you want to discuss with them. And so that is the entirety of the template. We tried to keep these fairly simple, fairly generic, so that they can be reused with many different topics. Um, and we would love to hear suggestions for more templates.
So I'm going to ask you a quick question, Arthur. On that, when you when you say when you hope people innovate on this, how how does that work, or where will that actually take place? Uh, are these shared documents, or is it part of the website, or people log in, or where, where can people find uh, those templates? Well, this this is actually kind of a sneak preview no. of what we're Sorry. doing today. <laughs> yeah. So um, we are working on these templates. We're refining them. Um, the the ones that Arthur has created are Google Docs. So you can actually just copy the Google Doc and uh, uh, Google Forms, I guess it's actually the Google Form, mm -hmm. and adapt it if you wanted to adapt it. Or you could just use it as is. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, we're looking at other platforms for sharing materials. There's also a, um, a lesson plan generator from one of the other language resource centers that might be a repository that we use for lesson plans. But right now, we're sort of exploring what are the best ways to enable that sharing. So we'd love to, yeah, to yeah, hear feedback and yeah. suggestions. Yeah. And oh, I think the that's the All end right. of our presentation. And All right. So wow, I mean, this is it's, it's amazing to see it. In, in the, and I work with it every day, but it's fun to see, see you guys talk actually. about it. Exactly. So um, some of the questions that I, I kind of wanted to start with, and maybe it was addressed a little bit in the chat room, but you talked about the origins of this, but what else exists out on the web like this? What else is out there that's doing something like this? It just seems like such a unique tool. Well, are, there, are there others in different languages that you know of? Or? Well, there's a lot of corpora that are available out there. The problem, I think that, um, and Arthur and, and Rachel have mentioned this, alluded to this, it's just not easy to use um, corpuses the way they are. You can't, for instance, sort your corpus very easily for I don't know, like Arthur said, the subjunctive in a meaningful way for the classroom. So I think what's, what's I don't think there's anything like this out there in terms of being able to search mm -hmm. a video for a grammar point and having a relevant video come back to you. Um, and I think this is sort of what's, I guess, revolutionary mm -hmm. about this process. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So getting to basically like this very fundamental question, why Spanish in Texas? Why not Spanish in America or Spanish in yeah, well, there's so many reasons. Um, this is a big project for us, the linguists. That's Jacqueline and me and Barbara um, talking now. Um, when we arrived at University of Texas about four years ago, we've only been here for four years, we were actually kind of surprised that there hasn't been a sort of a central effort from this, the flagship campus, to document um, the way Spanish is spoken in Texas. It's been done in sort of a real patch meal or patchwork sort of way. It's been done very impressionistically at times, and there's a heck of a lot of misinformation and, and stereotypes circulating about Spanish in Texas and about its speakers. So we really wanted to address that in some way. And we wanted to be able to dispel like some of the myths about uh, Spanish in Texas and Spanish in the U.S. more generally, um, that it's not Spanish, that it's not real Spanish, mm -hmm. that it's Spanglish, that it's Tex-Mex. Um, so we wanted to dispel some of those myths. and really address the needs of some of our students. We've got a, a large number of Latino students. Um, as Barbara said earlier, most of those students, um, most of our team who collected the videos are Latino students, and they are documenting the language that's in their community. So we felt that it was really important to bring that type of positive attention to Spanish in the way that had already been done here on this campus for German and English. And there's really two ways that you can dispel these types of misperceptions and stereotypes. And one is education. But people don't always listen, right? right? So you end up having to educate and educate and educate. But another way is experience. So if somebody has experience with something, um, then they'll learn to think of it differently. So you hear people talk about Spanglish. But this gives you an opportunity to explore what is, what is Spanglish. So they might think that Spanish in Texas is peppered with English, for instance. I think that's what everybody's perception really is. But this will allow students and teachers to get in there and see what is the English influence really in this body of speech that we have here. Right. Yeah. Um, and maybe come out of it with a real understanding of what's going on. So this is, I guess, an example of deeper learning. Yeah. 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 So you're talking about it on sort of two, approaching two levels. One is sort of a research basis. But then there's yeah. also this actual, hey, this is a teaching tool. This is a resource mm -hmm. for teachers to use. So are you, are you afraid of perhaps modeling or exposing students and teachers to these incorrect forms of Spanish or Spanglish, that somehow it's going to influence the way in which these students learn? Or, or? Yeah, that's a really yeah. good point. And mm -hmm. our hope is that these will provide real like, 
obvious teaching moment. I mean, what do we mean when we talk about bad Spanish and, and good Spanish? Um, you know, good Spanish is precisely what allows you to get through the day, to communicate with your friends and family. And if what your family produces are some of these forms that are considered to be non-standard or that don't appear in your textbook, those are forms that you should value. Um, so we, part of this is, it's not just um, an educational mission for us, but it's also a social mission, right? Trying to explore some of the ideologies that we have about particular varieties of language. Right. I mean, everyone talks about authentic materials, but really the materials that are provided as authentic aren't authentic at all. They're so old. Examples of that would be? Any textbook. Uh -huh. you know, any textbook is in like its 400th edition, but it still reflects basically 40-year-old ways of speaking. Mm -hmm. And, you know, dictionaries and textbooks or grammars are always behind the way people speak normally. This gives like a sort of open textbook that is really the way people speak. Yeah. So we might look at it as not being right, but if that's the way everyone speaks, over time that does become the way mm -hmm. that is correct, say. Yeah, so, so, so you mentioned this, Jack, you're talking about language variation, so mm -hmm. we're touching it, but, you know, are there other reasons why teachers should, should really care about language variation? I mean, uh, Sure, teachers should care about the type of language that their students bring to the classroom, right? I mean, you can even look at some of what some teachers might call incorrect Spanish as a way of scaffolding mm -hmm. to looking at what might be the targeted norm for a different type of discourse. Yeah, actually Maria is making a really good point now, and this is so classic. So all the textbooks teach these vosotros forms of Spanish. Oh, sure. Nobody in America, I mean, <laughs> Americas, plural, uses vosotros. Um, well, that's not true, but but it is pretty much true. And, and so, but they appear in the Spanish language textbooks, which is ridiculous. So we have a textbook that's kind of live, if you will. I mean, there's no textbook around it, but there easily could be. Um, so that's what we're doing. We have building on this point also, as I taught, been teaching uh, introductory Spanish a lot, and one of the things that tends to make uh, students less interested in learning Spanish is when they find out that the Spanish we're teaching is not the Spanish that they can use with their friends or at work. And so they'll start studying Spanish and they'll try to use it in real life, and it won't be positively received, and then they'll get turned off to what we're teaching them. So this is a good way to overcome that. So maybe tell, tell us a little bit more about some of the feedback that you've received from students, teachers, the folks that you've been working with about, about their use of the, of the tool and, and, and how people you know, have incorporated this into their teaching as well. Mostly we've had this incorporated into bilingual courses so far. And uh, that's been, we've had really positive reception with that because mm -hmm. the uh, students have really liked the idea of saying, hey, you know, the type of Spanish that I use at home is a valid type of Spanish that I can study in class, and it's not just, you know, the bad Spanish that they're always slapping me on the wrist for or whatever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think it's also fun for the students. I've used this in one of my classes on um, Spanish pronunciation, phonetics and phonology. Um, and even just in looking at that variation, it's really fun for even Spanish speakers to look at how very differently mm -hmm. they speak from some of their friends or how you know the Spanish of El Paso is so very different from the Spanish that's spoken in Laredo. Mm -hmm. So even for Spanish speakers, not just um, English speaking learners of Spanish, but for heritage Spanish speakers, um, it's really important for them to view variation as being like linguistically important and relevant. Yeah, so I think it's really interesting to, to notice that there's, there's that much variation just in Texas mm -hmm. I mean, when we're talking about this. I mean, these are Spanish speakers that you found throughout the state of Texas. Yeah. So can I just imagine how many more variations there are if you, you know, just do this in, mm -hmm. let's say, in the Northeast or out in Absolutely. California Absolutely. or wherever? Mm -hmm. and, and really, that's why we're right now sticking to Spanish in Texas, because we know that there's going to be differences between the Spanish spoken in Texas and the Spanish that's spoken in New York, mm -hmm. because you know, there, there's different origins of the Spanish. So right now, you know, we're just doing it here, and also because we want people to look at their lang the language that's spoken as a resource, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, this could be extended to cover to, to cover other varieties of Spanish. So do you have any resources. plans, or do you have colleagues that, that talk to you about uh, wanting to do this as well? Incorporate absolutely, this? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and one of the things that we've done throughout this process is really open up uh, all of the work that we've done. I mean, this is another kind of facet of being open is to really uh, document your process and share mm -hmm. that with people and and share sort of. 
um, you know, we're planning to share like the consent forms we used and um, everything that, so that somebody could really replicate what we've done in their own community. Mm -hmm. um, there's tools uh, that we've created to do this, the automatic tagging that, um, that it has allowed us to produce the search interface and those tools are all open source. And uh, so if there's other um, if there's others out there interested in, in replicating this, we have a model um, that we think could work in other contexts. Yeah. So you said you sort of had your focus on designing this for educators and teachers. Um, it seems like this is a tool that can be used by almost anyone. Though. I mean, just mm -hmm. learners that are out there. When we talk about MOOCs and this idea of opening the classroom and flipping mm -hmm. the classroom, and we've had people it. actually. When we had just a few of the videos up on a what, like a little publicity site when we started this project, we had someone contact us from was it Sober Croatia? Oh so, yeah, so someone's already used this for a class project in Sober Croatia. Wow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so, so you never know. Yeah, <laughs> when you open it up, you know, it, it opens up all kinds of uses that you never would have imagined. Yeah. So, so did you envision, right, as in talking about the series when we're talking about OER, did you, did you have it at the outset for this to be a project that would be labeled as an openly licensed project? Or, or was it just something that, I mean, did, did, I mean, how did you arrive at that decision? Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah, from the beginning, exactly. it was um, open, and partly because we, we feel like the people who would be most interested in this are um, heritage speakers themselves, that is, people from Hispanic backgrounds themselves, and teachers of, of these students. Um, and these are precisely people who need open education resources that reflect their own experience. Um, they need things that are low cost, they need things that are easily accessible, they need things that are flexible and that they can contribute to, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, this is perfect for us, this open platform. Yeah. Um, and I would like to also point out, I know this is already to mention, but um, we've really tried to make this so that it'll be as useful as possible in the classroom. And just to give you an idea, three of the people on the team are currently teaching um, introductory or intermediate level Spanish. And we have been trying to keep in mind, how could I use this myself in my class? What features would I want? And so we've tried to really make this as user friendly and as um, useful as possible. Yeah, so one of the questions from the chat room kind of builds on this idea is how, how could you uh, integrate this into resources that you're already teaching with? Let's say it's a textbook or a workbook or give us an example of, of where this might fit in or how it might fit in best. Okay, so for example, a lot of times in a textbook there will be a grammar plan or something and the students just aren't getting it. Mm -hmm. And so you want to give them a demonstration of how it's actually being used. And so this is a great tool to, to do that. And then also some textbooks do provide like audio um, examples or video samples, but they're almost always staged and they're really fake and cheesy. So this <laughs> provides something where it's it's real and the students react to that. They can tell that this is real. They can tell this isn't somebody who's reading a script. And they enjoy it a lot more than those other materials that, from what I've seen. Yeah, I love, I love some of the comments in the chat room. I folks can read them, but they, I love languages because they're living things and <laughs> all sorts of wonderful fun things to be reading here. Um, so. Uh, I think, I mean, one of the things that I, I noticed, and I, I maybe have you briefly touch on it, but what is a corpus? Or our, when we're talking about the corpora, uh, when you mentioned that, so touch on that for a little bit for people who may not know what that is. I'm going to kick oh. this one to Arthur. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so for the past couple of decades, uh, researchers at universities have been saying, you know, we need to use corpora in teaching languages. And basically what they're talking about is any conglomeration of language. So whether it's video archives or a whole bunch of texts that have been combined or stories or whatever. So they're just talking about a big bunch of language. And specifically in our corpus what it is is obviously the videos but also the transcriptions of those videos and all the tagging that goes along with that that we have automated. Yeah, there's all kinds of corpora. I think I think you alluded to one of them earlier. You had the, the Gutenberg project. Yeah, the Project Gutenberg. Yeah, project course. Gutenberg. So Project Gutenberg is enormous. So essentially, Project Gutenberg seeks to take anything written in the English language and scan it, so that you have just billions of words. I mean, yeah, from right. you know from Shakespeare, well even before Shakespeare right. forward. Right. All public domain. Yeah, content. everything is there, and so this allows people to go through and see how language has changed over time. You can compile dictionaries. You can. You can do all kinds of things with a corpus of that magnitude. Yeah. One of the problems with the difficulties of those corpora um, traditionally as far as using them in the classroom has been that the tools that they come with um, 
are not designed for educators. So for example, the, um, the British National Corpus or the Corpus del, del Español from Martínez at BYU, these corpora are great. They're really uh, wonderful tools for researchers, but they're pretty hard to use in the classroom. And all the different discussions that have been going on for the past couple decades about we need to do data-driven learning and all this other kind of stuff, you can't really do that with the tools that are provided with you for you with those corpora. So we've tried to change that around and make the tools there from the get-go so that you can do these things. Yeah. So what, uh, what teaching level is this most appropriate for? I mean, we've talked a lot about this bridging this gap between research and practice, but where do you feel like it's most effectively used? Sure, yeah, I think um, that probably for the high school level, um, so these materials would work well there, in part because we have um, all of these adult interviews, um, and the types of themes that are addressed in the questions are ones that would probably be most interesting to older learners. Um, we're oftentimes asked, and I think someone's already asked it on, um, on your listing there, whether we intend to uh, add children to this corpus, oh, yeah. and you know, at the moment, no, <laughs> um, it is something that that could be done. Uh, we'd like to start first with these adults until we have the procedure up and running. Um, and our aim is to add other corpora from colleagues at, at other institutions, but they too will likely be adult. Um, so, what's adult what interviews. is the desire to focus on children just to appeal to that audience? So you can teach it in, in lower grades? In lower levels, but also like here in Texas we've got all of those dual language programs yeah. and they would hugely benefit from this type of authentic language yeah. material. Yeah. yeah, and we didn't do children just because we don't yet know um, how to get videos of them. Um, they don't sit still, they're not going to look at the camera. Um, yeah. they, we can't use the same, the same type of protocol that we've used to get this from the, the, these interviews with the adults. Mm -hmm. So that really has been the sticking point. It's just, mm -hmm. you know, what is going to be the procedure that we would use with the children? Sure. You know, we can't call this a representative corpus. It, it doesn't represent the way everyone speaks mm -hmm. um, because we've asked a certain series of questions and because we don't have children and things like that. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, but it could be turned into that over time and we're welcome, you know, we'd welcome anybody's mm -hmm. ideas yeah. about yeah. this. But at the university level, you can use this corpus not only for a language class, but for all different types of content courses, and not just courses in, in linguistics, um, but specific to like classes in Spanish linguistics. This is ideal for a course in sociolinguistics, mm -hmm. right, where you can see variation um, across um, regions. So you can look at regional variation. You can look at variation across gender. Um, we also have we know quite a bit about um, these speakers, so we can look at their specific background, their personal histories, their language backgrounds. We can see whether or not speakers who've lived here for multiple generations show different types of innovations from those who are more recently arrived. So there's quite a lot that you can do with this corpus. There's one aspect of it that's already interested some of our students, and that is why it is that one of these speakers, um, who's from Peru, and he says right there that he's mm -hmm. from Peru, but he already sounds very Mexican, and it has a lot to do with his social networks. And that's all type of information that you can get from these types of sociolinguistic interviews that then are relevant not only for language teaching, but also for linguistic research. So I'm going to get to a question by Maria in a second, but I wanted to ask a little mm -hmm. bit of a follow-up on, on how you did this. You said you resembled it on the sort of StoryCorps project mm -hmm. and this interview. Uh -huh. You talked about the size of the resource. Um, I can't remember the first slide in terms of how many actual videos you have. Or we have 134. Well, so in, the, in the archive right now, there's uh, 328 video clips, clips from 33 speakers. Yeah, right. Yeah. So would there, do, you, do you envision a second phase to the interview process doing it? I mean, when you talked about you couldn't capture all these linguistic variations. I mean, are there, are there different cities you want to sure. get to? I mean, or? like somebody said here, language is a living thing. And, and if we don't, I mean, you kind of have, you're kind of forced to, to keep building on this because if not, we're just documenting Spanish as it's spoken in Texas at one point in time. And in, in, in 15 years, people aren't going to be speaking the same way, right? I mean, there's fads in language. So this needs to, obviously, it needs to, to grow. It needs to stay mm -hmm. This is another organic. reason why we would keep it open. Yeah, so that which is a great reason to be open. continue to contribute. Yeah. All right, so let's, I mean, so Maria is getting at this question of how she can add and, and change what you have in here. And, and one of the questions is, what, well, is, What's next? Is that one of the features that you're thinking about? Or? 
Right, and I, I should have mentioned the, the specific license that we use on our videos. It's a CC by non-commercial share alike. So that means that you can't use it, you can't use our videos to make money. And whatever you produce with the videos, you have to also share. So um, any of those videos, as I showed, can be downloaded. So you could take the video, download it, and add it to your own materials um, and publish your own materials um, with that video, as long as you uh, attribute us. And there's a terms of use page on the website that says exactly how you need to, to attribute us. Um, but the idea is with that embed function and the download function that the videos can be removed from the corpus or used in different contexts. Yeah. And then all of the materials that are currently in development, and we hope to have some templates up by August, um, will be provided in an editable format. So whether that's Google Docs, we're still working out the details, but everything that is that is published there, you'll be able to take it and edit it. and and customize it for your students. So uh, following up on this licensing issue, somebody's asking a question about, well, well, why not using BBC World Language Resources for middle school students? And their programs are good, but we talk about maybe the difference between what open means and free means in this context. I suppose uh, you can access these BBC resources, but, right. but you can't really do much more of that. Right. Right. I mean, you could even take our videos and re-edit them or edit them together. You could have your students, you know, edit a, a collage of videos. I mean, there's just, you can really, you're, you're free to use them, you know, as, as you wish. So you don't have to just use it in the context of our website. You can pull it out of that context and, and add it to your own uh, web-based materials. Yeah, so for example, I know that one common practice is to play an audio segment uh, and, or a video segment for like an exam and then the students have to transcribe it or they have to answer some question about the content. And you could just cut like whatever a 10 second slice out of one of our videos and then play that for the class and use that for your uh, test content. Yeah, so I mean, just adding to this, and this is Garen, but one of, the, one of the things that we talked about in the previous webinars was this contrast between free and open. And, and of course, teachers, at, at least in the US, have the flexibility of using any kind, type of content under fair use guidelines in their classroom, right? But there's a certain limitation with regard to then how you, if you do create a lesson plan using those materials, and we see it oftentimes with folks who use uh, clips from the BBC, let's say, or, or audio from NTV or songs and things like that, when you want to share that with colleagues, you're, you're restricted because of the copyright that goes with those materials. And while other teachers may be able to use that in their classrooms, uh, folks outside the, the sort of walls of the classroom um, are, are unable to use that. And what we're seeing in the sort of changing landscape of, of education is that there are very few walls left. So. Uh, using open educational resources to start with or using openly licensed content provides that flexibility for others to sort of keep on using, remixing, remashing, and, and, and sharing and improving the, the community. So uh, just as a, as, a, as a note on this con distinction between free and open. So This is Natalie. And I just wanted to mention in the chat room, Taryn is also pointing out that many schools block um, certain websites and uh, streaming is sometimes impossible. So when you can download the video and put it up on your own website or on the school website, that makes it much easier for certain high schools. Yeah, or even just bring it in on a DVD or something. Mm -hmm. So we've talked a little bit about the changes that you want to make. How can people stay up to date about uh, the changes that are going to occur or where can they find out more information and, and, or where can they even send suggestions uh, for, mm -hmm. for uh, improvements or, or resources that they would love to contribute? Yeah, well, there's a variety of ways to get involved. Um, if you want to sign up, we do have a mailing list. Um, that's actually from the SpanishInTexas.org website. You'll see a Get Involved link. Uh, and you can sign up for our email list, and, and that will um, keep you up to date on everything that's going on with the project. We also have a Facebook page, which I actually didn't list on here, but if you just look up Spanish in Texas on Facebook, uh, you'll find us. Um, in, the, in our new video archive, um, as I mentioned, this is in development, so, uh, but we, we want you to use it. So <laughs> um, we, don't, we wanted to put something out there and uh, have the development shaped by how people are actually using it. So if you go to the site now and start searching, you know, we're going to 
you don't you don't need to set up an account. It helps us just to uh, know what uh, you you want to search for and what's interesting to you. And then we also have once you've tried out the site, just a uh, brief uh, survey. It's two minutes um, just uh, to kind of tell us about your experience on the site. So. Um, and then, of course, we have a contact form on the, the website, so if you have any um, ideas for how you would like to collaborate with us, we, we'd be very interested to talk with you about your ideas. Very good. Yeah. Anything else you'd like to share here? There's one question that I think Rachel needs to, uh, the custom playlist, can you explain oh, yeah. a little real quickly what it's Right, mm -hmm. so the custom play, that playlist, that's um, what I was uh, showing when you can, uh, if, if, now this is if you have an account on the Spintext Video Archive site, you can save videos. So you can, if you add a video to your favorites, that will appear in a list. So that's what we mean by a custom playlist. Um, also the tagging feature, also then you can, uh, once you tag a video, you can view a list of videos that all have your tag on it. So. Yes. That's what we mean when we say custom playlist. Right. So, for instance, I have my own little tag that says um, code switching. So, in this, every video that that I find that has people speaking both Spanish and English in the same utterance, then I tag it as code switching. Um, but people can tag it for whatever they want to tag for. Yeah. So, it's a, Patricia had mentioned earlier that some of the clips on the video archive contain language mixing and, and that they're uh, and Marty had answered something about we, you guys are trying to tag occurrences of that code switching, but it's pretty challenging and, and, and not a reality. So it's something that you're going to try and incorporate, or is it just something that's quite different? Um, yeah, we, we, which Marty's right. It's hard, but yeah. we're working on it. Yeah. yeah. All right. I also want to mention um, it's it's kind of late notice, but we we do have an open call right now for uh, educators. If you're an educator in Texas. Uh, Preferably around the Austin area or someone who can get to Austin easily. We are uh, doing a, a kind of a focus, like a, a working group um, to to try and get together and create some materials. So I, I, I know we, we, we want to open this up beyond just people who are able to physically be in Austin eventually, but if, if that's a situation that works for you and you're an educator that's interested in helping us to develop some some of these lesson plans and templates that we've been talking about. If you go to our SpanishInTexas.org website, you can see a link to the application and some more information about that. Okay. Well, cool. That brings us, I think, to the sort of end of the webinar hour. I want to thank you all for joining us today and talking about the project. It's really exciting. And um, it sounds like there's a lot of great opportunity for folks to get involved and just something that's meeting a need that, that isn't really yet been met. So, uh, it's really neat to see it. I want to thank you, Natalie, for the wonderful three webinars and, uh, and, and invite people to sort of stay tuned to what we're doing uh, throughout the fall and into the next year with uh, other webinars that we might offer on some of the projects that we're working on or, or people that we find interesting. So stay tuned on our website or on our blog and send us questions uh, to info at coral.utexas.edu. Um, and, and thank you, Garen, for uh, putting on those three webinars. Oh, we're leading us to uh, some very good content. Mm -hmm. That's great. Thank you all for participating. Yep. All right. Thank you. Thank you much. Thank you.